I'm Claude Lebrun from Stony Brook University, and I'm here today to interview Eugenio Calabi uh, on behalf of the Simon Center at Stony Brook. We're being hosted by the University of Pennsylvania Mathematics Department. Uh, for people that are unfamiliar with uh, uh, Gene's work. Uh, his name is often uh, the first part of the, the phrase Kalabi Yao, which represents an important class of solutions of Einstein's equations. And, uh, and rep that represents uh, one of the important first or early contributions that Gene made to mathematics, followed by many others. Um, so I, I'd like to begin, Gene, just by asking you, before we get to mathematics, could you say a little bit about um, uh, your childhood and uh, okay. how you came to the United States? Sure. Uh, I, I was born, grew up in Italy. Uh, my, my, uh, my father was a lawyer, and uh, he realized quite in my earliest age, in preschool age, that I <coughs> I was uh, I was gifted for mathematics. So when I remember that in, I was in first or second grade uh, trying to m memorize the table of multiplication and he, uh, he explained to me what a prime number was. <laughs> and uh, he told me, your job is to find the law to how, how prime numbers uh, succeed one another. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and, order. <laughs> and it was his standard question to me, have you found the law of prime numbers? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, that, that's the background. I also had a, uh, a teacher in middle school. Where did a, you grow up in Italy? In Milan. <clears throat> I went to public school there through, uh, well, what you might call 10th grade. And... Uh, the, the, the teacher there had a, quite a reputation because uh, even though the, <clears throat> the middle and high school where, where I, went, uh, I was was uh, preeminently <clears throat> on classics, uh, Latin and Greek. And, uh, but the, uh, at the technical university, Polytechnicum of Milan, Polytechnico, uh, the uh, people, the the students who seem to be more proficient in mathematics, they always ask them whether they study for this man they're already going to the technical high school. <laughs> so and, uh, he had quite a reputation, although he never wrote a textbook. But uh, anyway, and I left when I was about 15 with my family. I spent a year in France waiting well, for the American visa. This was... What 38 year was that? to 39. So, just before the world, the world, so, uh, world War II broke out. So, you had already been through the horror of uh, Mussolini's uh, racial laws and so forth? That's yes, so it, it had just begun in 38, the laws. The, uh, my father started getting alarmed when Hitler was, uh, was always uh, suspicious, at least, or contemptuous of Mussolini throughout. He had, he had known him as a, he had worked as a reporter and uh, uh, before going, while well, he was still a law student. Anyway, um, he started planning actually a, poss a possible exit from Italy from, I would, I would guess, from 1936. At the end of the Ethiopian War, and uh, the breakout of the Sp Spanish Civil War, in which Italy uh, and Hitler were allies of the Franco side. <clears throat> and when the racial laws came out, he, uh, he decided there, there and then, overnight, that uh, we had to put the family safe. Well done. And uh, so eventually we came here in the spring of 39. And you were how old when you got to the United States? Uh, 16. And I was already, 
I, w I got admitted right away at MIT. I was uh, various um, uh, quirks of scheduling. I skipped a year of both entering and another one exiting France. <laughs> and uh, Noah was not even meaning to. Your family was also in Boston, or uh, were they? No, they were in. They stayed in New York, and I commuted. Well, I commuted. Uh, uh, my home was New York, but I was uh, I was always staying in Boston, except on vacation time, and they t they became scarce <laughs> uh, in wartime. But then you went on to graduate school at Princeton. Uh, by the time I graduated. I had decided uh, that even though I had uh, majored in, in chemical engineering, uh, by the end of the war, my records showed uh, much better results in mathematics. So <laughs> while looking for a chemical job, I had already decided to switch as I was finishing after the military service. Were your parents supportive of that change? When, when you decided to go into mathematics rather than... Uh, I was. My parents were not. <laughs> they, they had just returned. In 46, they went back, back to Italy. <coughs> As a lawyer, my father had, could not practice in this country and was anxious to get back to his own work. <laughs> and, uh, he, he did as soon as, as possible. They, they he, went back to Milano or elsewhere? Yes, back to his... He reopened his his office in '46 immediately, and uh, he, he was also shrewd in that respect. The uh, the, the returning uh, returning refugees in Italy, who um, in, in in various other categories of professions, the um, after 47, it was much harder to reintegrate. And uh, my brother, well, since my father had started suffering from heart disease, my brother, who had degrees from both Italy and this country, had even opened a practice briefly in New York, decided to move back to Italy. And my sisters, uh, two sisters, were, one, uh, one was married and moved back to Italy with her husband, uh, Tullia Zevi. He, was a, he became a fairly well-known architectural historian. And, uh, she, uh, and, uh, and another sister instead stayed in this country. But... Uh, that's what I so, so what year did you start at, uh, in graduate school at Princeton? Uh, well, I started not in Princeton. Oh, uh, I thought you were chemical engineering. I applied in for both Harvard and Princeton in 47, oh. early 47, beginning of 47. And uh, um, I was admitted to both, but uh, at MIT, at, uh, at, at uh, Princeton, they, they offered uh, temporary housing for graduate <laughs> students, so I went, I went there. <laughs> Important decisions are often made on the flimsy, flimsiest basis, right? It's, uh, oh, yes. But you do have to have a place to live. But I, I did spend a, uh, two terms at the University of Illinois. Ah. That was my start, really, real start in pure mathematics in 47, as well for the uh, winter and spring terms. And that, that summer I moved into Princeton. So uh, did you start working with Solomon Bachner immediately, or was that uh, later? About a year or two, the second year, in 48. I, I knew Bachner very slightly uh, when I was a, an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a course from him. Yes. Um, he was known primarily for his work in Fourier analysis, but, uh, he, uh, but he had done, written some articles in, uh, uh, in differential geometry, and uh, I mean Eisen, uh, Eisenhart had retired, uh, and he was still around, but not teaching anymore. 
So Bachner was the person that knew something about differential geometry. Yes. In particular, worked on Ricci curvature. He had an right. important theorem about harmonic forms. He That's seemed right. to be very skeptical in that article about uh, about uh, the hodge Ram theorem. <laughs> so he doesn't actually, he talks about harmonic forms, but he doesn't talk about how they're related to topology at all. No, no, no. <laughs> That, that, that I learned, I learned only later. <laughs> but I, I was uh, strictly differential geometry, and the problem of the, uh, the problem of selecting ma metrics. The uh, manifolds have many possible metrics, and uh, uh, whether there are any pr problems about the, the function space of all metrics. There was a, a nonlinear analysis was oh, yeah. still at the at the very <laughs> in infancy at the time. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, but it was the, uh, the geometrical aspects that attracted me. And uh, Kayla Manifold seemed to be the, the, work, the, the area to work in where there was a, a, an inner structure that was, uh, was really visible to me. I guess Bachner also started working on, on Kähler geometry uh, not very long after his paper on harmonic one forms. Oh, yes. But he refers to the mo Kähler metrics, he always refers to them as so called Kähler metrics. Yes. He apparently knew that Kähler had been a Nazi and was very uh, unhappy with the man over this. Um, so, um, but uh, that's presumably, but it, you, you'll, if, if he says Kähler, it's always pre preceded by so called. <laughs> well, okay. No, uh, I hadn't noticed that. But they, uh, I had met Kayla when I was uh, just just finished uh, my, my doctorate in 1950. It was the uh, first international meeting of uh, mathematics at Harvard. The, the ICM. I attended. Uh, the the ICM. International Congress of Mathematicians? Yes. And uh, I met Kayla there and uh, spoke with him briefly. I mean, uh, I'd done... Uh, my thesis was also already on Kähler metrics, the, uh, the embedding problem. Oh, yes, 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 I see. The embedding problem. And uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, 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 I invented the word for the, uh, in my thesis, the diastasis, <laughs> and this, the uh, distance function. Right. I mean, put the uh, normalized potential for Kähler metrics. That works in the analytic case only. When did you really become interested in Ricci curvature? Had that already? Um, and, That's and uh, strictly from reading Bachner's papers, but uh, coupling that with the uh, f fixing the metric and uh, the idea that the Ricci tensor, uh, by that time I, I had understood that it was. Uh, the homology class of it, the cohomology class of it, uh, the characteristic class, was uh, well established, and uh, that the metric was uniquely determined by the Ricci curvature, and then uh, the the reverse problem <laughs> was whether any form of that class compatible uh, corresponded to a and uh, uh, what was um, uh, obviously a unique metric. And uh, that probably motivated my, my first uh, studying of, uh, of uh, partial differential equations. By 1954, the next International Congress, you spoke in, at the Congress in Amsterdam, I believe? Yes. And that was when you first uh, announced uh, your entire program about representing Kähler classes on compact Kähler manifolds by yes, but I, I also wrote, wrote the first paper uh, on the, um, uh, the, the, gener the so-called generaliza generalization uh, of the, uh, um, uh, the theorem on the on the Hessians. On real numbers. Oh yes, yeah. so, so convex you, functions. So you were, you started be inter being interested in affine geometry and and convex. Affine geometry, uh, again by accident. I, uh, my first job at in Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana the, State uh, University. Right? Uh, at LSU, yes. Um, 
the uh, Smith, uh, Smith Klein, the Smith Klein, the Smith uh, who was at the, had just died, and his uh, his widow had uh, put his library for sale, <laughs> and I bought the um, the book on uh, I find differential geometry this by Blaschka. By Blaschka. Yeah, I find it, and I read it and was fascinated by it. And uh, so I, uh, I started with that problem with the fact that the only entire functions, entire convex functions in invariables with the uh, unimodular Hessian. So this work on real, the, the real Mange-Ampere equation, was that yes. before or after you started thinking about complex Mange-Ampere and, and uh, Ricci flat Taylor methods? Simultaneous. Simultaneous. It was a step toward it. I see. So, but you were, you were already... I was motivated by the, the other one, but I also became interested in affine differential geometry on its own right. And in fact, uh, my current interest, as, uh, as it is at least, pretends to be or to, pretend to follow... <laughs> My age, I can't do much anymore. Uh, is still in affine geometry. Still, it's it's quite amazing that you're still trying to do mathematics and uh, with some success. I saw you, you give a very nice talk a couple of years ago. Um, so how old are you now? Ninety? Ninety-six. Ninety-six. And still uh, at it. That's wonderful. Well, uh, uh, Louis, <laughs> uh, what uh, was it been called? Research simulation. <laughs> <laughs> well, doing mathematics is such a kick. You, you, how could you possibly want to give it up? Well, <laughs> my favorite hobby. <laughs> We're very lucky that someone actually wants to pay us to pursue our hobbies. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, uh, follow, your, follow your hobbies for, as a profession, as a, the, the extraordinary luck I've had in my life. Yes, yes. So uh, we were talking about some things that happened in 1954. I think that was the year you also submitted your paper for the Lefschetz uh, Festschrift yes. uh, volume, and that's the one that lays out the oh, Kalabi yes. conjecture. That's right. Uh, at the time, I think you, you thought at first maybe you could prove it, but then by the end of the paper, you're, you're expressing grave doubts about well, uh, one uh, aspect of the continuity method. Right? I remember... Uh, Hearing for the first time in my life, I, in that period, there were a priori estimates. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Could you tell the story about how, uh, uh, about how you came to, I think it was Nirenberg, you, you told me that... Uh, what? That uh, Nirenberg... Oh, said when, uh, oh when, uh, when Yao had the solution. No, 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 or early on. So you wrote me a letter once in which you claimed that you had sent your paper for the, uh, the Lefschetz le uh, yes, volume okay. to Andre oh, Bay. Yes, uh, yes. and uh, uh, was at a meeting in Trieste in Italy. And that's where the meeting where I actually met Nirenberg. And uh, uh, Nirenberg, and, uh, well, bears at you already from earlier. And uh, I, I was talking to them about this uh, problem. I said, <laughs> and finally they, they told me, you cannot solve partial differential equations without a priori est <laughs> estimates. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I mean... Uh, I think this is a great tale for any young mathematician to hear because we all start off, even very, even very, very talented people start off from a, a position of relative ignorance, right? And then you have to talk to the experts and find out so I, know, I now but, realize. But uh, you know, in, in, uh, the point is that you you learn, you not learn during the course. You learn after when you're <laughs> mulling over a course. That's been at least my experience. Yes, I'm I've been a slow learner anyway. <laughs> in that respect. Well, s slow and steady wins the race. So <laughs> well, it's it. it I, I I think that uh, I mean your your paper on the Kalabi conjecture that is uh, an amazing paper. It's very, very impressive. And, uh, but uh, apparently you, you, you sent this to Andre Ve, right? You must have been thinking that he was the expert on K3 surfaces or? Well, uh, no, that, uh, uh, I asked him whether it was of, of any interest in 
because I, I, I knew very little about algebraic geometry at the time. And I, I asked him, he said, uh, uh, he asked me very quickly, but, uh, how, do you, how do you prove it? And then, <laughs> And, and then he, he's, he, was a, he was a very brilliant man, but not known for generosity. And uh, so there, there are various people who uh, had stories to tell about Andre Ve having kind of... He was a very smart guy, and he liked to show that he was the smartest guy in the room. Oh, yes, right? I know. He, <laughs> I, I, I was intimidated by him, actually. Uh, I spent a year at the Institute in 50... Uh, 53, 54, I think. Oh, so it was right around, so he was actually uh, uh, in the United States during that time. And, oh, uh, yes, he, was, he came in, uh, during World War II, or shortly after. So he spent uh, some time at Chicago, I know, but, that, yes. that, but uh, he also, he was there. Uh, part, of, part of his career was at the Institute. Uh, That's right. He was, uh, uh, he, he was in Chicago before coming to the Institute. So, so far, so you were a Bachner student, yes. and you had, uh, I guess, given a talk at the Lefschetz Festschrift. This makes me wonder, I've heard all of these stories about how the two men, Bachner basically would not talk to Lefschetz, was the story no, I heard. No, that's right. Do you know what that was all about? Uh, no, I, heard, I heard various rumors, I think, but it, it happened long before I came to Princeton. And it uh, must have happened just uh, shortly after Mochta came there. Or uh, I, I forgot which, which one of the two came first. But the, um, uh, it must have been a, uh, something about salaries. So <laughs> something very, <laughs> very provincial. But I've, I've been told that in particular, Bachner did not want to be in the same room as Lafschetz. That's right. And uh, yeah, even when we had... Invited speakers. Um, one thing that Lefschetz uh, liked to do is to get the students acquainted with the speakers. So he encouraged them to have the reception for the speakers at the gra of wherever they were renting, uh, either at the graduate college or in their room or the suites in town. The, um, and uh, the, the usual routine is Lefschetz would come very early and then, and, and leave early, and then we call Bokhtar. And he <laughs> said, uh, oh, but it's uh, the, uh, the usual conversation, uh, or typical. Uh, uh, but it's getting very late, isn't it? Uh, no, it's fine, everybody's here. But uh, uh, has anybody, but the people must be leaving. Oh, yes, but very few. Uh, for example, <laughs> I did one or two. Left. Okay, I mean, I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a mystery that, uh, you know, they were both very major mathematicians. Uh, oh, yes. No, they, they respected each other. I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I heard, at least I uh, heard Bachner quoting Lefschetz. Uh, the other way around, I did, I did not follow Lefschetz too closely. But I think uh, it happened. Well, There's so. certainly many results uh, yeah. proved by later mathematicians that use ideas from Lefschetz combined with ideas from Bachner. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> it's uh, what a strange thing. So when you first finished your degree, you went to Louisiana State University. Yes. And you were there for a short period of time? or Three years. For 50, well, uh, 52 or so. I stayed as a postdoc in Princeton for half a year or so. Uh, and then in uh, 50, 51, I went, I mean, a year after the doctorate, I went to, uh, I got to Louisiana. Did you have anyone to, to talk with there? Was I went with another student, uh, with Newton Hawley. And uh, we thought of uh, helping build up a department. But the, uh, we, we, we actually did get a few uh, fairly well, people who became fairly well known in the fields, like, uh, well, uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, but uh, I got uh, married there. Where did you meet? We met in New York 
um, she was uh, family was living in Cuba, and she was visiting an uncle who lived in New York. Ah. After a year on leave in Princeton, with, and uh, was there for two years, then I got an offer a visiting professorship at at Caltech. Ah. Well, that was, uh, I think, a direct consequence of the papers you mentioned, the abstracts <laughs> you, you mentioned on the conjectures. I was there, and there I met with uh, Fell. And uh, did, did you actually go to Caltech? Yes, for one year. For one year, and then you, after that you went where? Uh, after, at the end of that year, I uh, decided not to go back to, to uh, Louisiana, I uh, applied for the institute, and uh, the, um, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, you know, Eisenhart or somebody, uh, well, maybe even Andre, Andre May, such as, no, Morse. Morse oh, Morse and Morse. He suggested that I apply to the institute. And uh, I applied. But then I got an offer from, when I was at Caltech, I got an offer from uh, the University of Minnesota. And I was waiting for the, I told them I had to wait uh, because I, was, I had the application for the institute. And I was like, hoping to spend a year or two there. But the, uh, 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 the, the, there was no answer for a while. And uh, then I was at uh, the end of the year, there was a conference, a math conference at, uh, at uh, Berkeley that I was planning to attend. As I went there, I told the people at, uh, at Caltech that if I got any letters from the Institute, forward it to me immediately. <laughs> I waited there. And, uh, and uh, while I was in Berkeley, both Milgram and Rosenblum were there in Berkeley at that conference, and they were urging me to answer their, on their offer. <laughs> and uh, there was no answer. And uh, so I said, fine, I'll I go. I, I, I go. And you to, just withdrew uh, your, your application from the, for the I, I, went, I went to the uh, acceptor there, and uh, when I finally got there to Minneapolis, uh, and I got the forwarded mail back from, from <laughs> Caltech. There was the offer from the Institute. <laughs> the secretaries there had ignored it. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, this was a tenure-track job that you'd moved to, right? In yes. Minnesota. So that, that actually yes. has a lot of so advantages. I, I went to the Institute two years later. Uh, yeah. But you were already married by that time? And oh, I was... I was married while I was in Louisiana. And my wife lived there with, for two, two second year, two final years there. And you started having children? Uh, in, uh, the children were born in Minneapolis. How long were you in Minneapolis? All, all Nine years with leaves, at, uh, two leaves. I was, uh, uh, I was once in, uh, at the, one for the institute, and then once at the IHES in Vure. And oh, that, I didn't realize that was up and running then. They, that was, it would have been a very new institute then, right? And, uh, oh, yes. And, uh, and then I also I went one semester in Chicago, uh, right after Church had left, I was sort of a substitute for him <laughs> for one semester. So uh, for the benefit of our, our, our listeners, uh, it might be good to uh, now review just a, a little bit about the, the statement of the what's now called the Calabi-Yau theorem, that if you have a compact uh, Kähler manifold, then if you specify a, a, any volume form, provided it has the, the, the right integral, um, yes. that you can represent in a given Kähler class, mm -hmm. you can find a, a, a unique metric with that volume form. And then this has a consequence that if the first churn class of the Kähler manifold is zero, you can prove that there is a unique Ricci flat Kähler yes. metric in each Kähler class. Mm -hmm. 
So in your, your paper in the Lefschetz volume, you give a truly beautiful geometric proof of the fact that the solution, if it exists, is unique. Yes. And um, this is, is, is one of, th th this is a just beautiful argument, of basically a maximum principle argument. Well, the, uh, sure, the, it's the, uh, the Bochdor <laughs> principle. <laughs> It's, um, but I, I definitely think that your, your paper is still worth reading because the, the uniqueness is so beautifully explained there. And of course, as it turned out in terms of proving existence, you had one of the key ideas, the continuity method, but in terms of actually showing that the set of, of parameters for which you have a solution of the perturbed equation, that that's closed, you needed other ideas, and that oh, yeah. was only solved by Yao in the 1970s. That's right. There were... Uh, the, uh, uh, that's another dramatic episode because when, when he first announced it, well, well he had, uh, earlier he thought he had the counterexample, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, that was uh, that was wrong. He, he recognized it, but then when he announced the proof shortly, not long after, maybe less than a year, well, there was a great deal of excitement. We had to hear the details. And uh, we had uh, arranged a meeting as soon as we could, a place where we could. And the meeting took place on Christmas Day <laughs> in, in Nuremberg's office in New York. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, of course, Yao and Nuremberg and Bears and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I just, uh, myself, we, we were met there in his office, I heard the first proof. <laughs> uh, which I did not understand, but uh, understand, I, uh, I don't think I can reproduce now the full details. So uh, d did he concentrate, there's a C0 estimate which is, is done by iterating in LP spaces? Yes. Uh, but in, there's also a sort of a key C3 estimate that's based on your earlier work in affine geometry, right? Does, oh yes. Did, did he discuss that in the same yes, lecture? Yes, he, he was it. So, so you, you, you told me once that that was the first paper where you proved yeah, something with a priori well, estimates, right? Yeah, well, uh, it was a celebration <laughs> my first, under, first uh, understanding of, of analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with respect to uh, your work on extremal Kähler metrics, uh, well, actually, one, one odd... Uh, historical thing that some people even in the field may not know. There have been a lot of papers on Kähler-Einstein metrics with non-zero scalar curvature, and they have often put in the title this is a proof of Kalabi's conjecture. Yes. Uh, whereas you didn't actually explicitly say that, although it, it follows from your assertions about constant scalar curvature. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I, I realized only later that the, the, the constant scalar curvature is obstructed in some manifolds. When did you first realize that? Uh, when the paper by Futaki appeared. Oh, I see. So, uh, so Futaki. Yes. So you'd had these concerns about holomorphic vector fields. It's it's there in your first article sure. about constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics. You you assume from the beginning that you're look, you're on a manifold which supports no holomorphic vector fields, but you don't say why that's that's an important fact. You were somehow aware of the fact that the the variational problem that you were oh, looking yes. at. Oh have. yes, I, I was uh, interested really as a variational problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, the the first uh, the first examples of extremes that uh, of extremal metrics in which the curvature is not constant. Uh, I even wrote a short paper announcing it. It's a very, it, it, it's a fairly long paper that's in, in uh, Yao's conference volume. He was seminar on differential geometry, and it's a very b beautiful uh, article where you discuss the more the general variational problem, show mm. what the Euler-Lagrange equations are, and then produce solutions on blow-ups of, for example, CP2 blown up at a point supports oh, yes. solutions in every Kähler class which have non-constant scalar curvature. Mm. But so, uh, when did you actually find those solutions? Was that just in the process of writing that paper, That's or you had yes, in the process? So this is in the early nineteen eighties. So. Yes, but so I don't remember the exact 
orders and all those. That's a little detail that's lost in the confusion of history. So we, those are now usually called extremal Kähler metrics, although it was not shown that they were a minima for yeah. a long time. You had would, you would given a beautiful proof in the constant scalar curvature case oh, yes. that actually the, if you have a That's solution, it, it is the minimum of sure. the functional. Uh, it was, I think, uh, your student Xu Shong Chen that first proved uh, uh, that, uh, that they were always minimizers oh, yes. in, in the general case. Mm -hmm. How many students have you actually had? Very few. Uh, I had a lousy reputation. <laughs> As a lecturer, I think uh, uh, that, that's not what I've heard. What I've heard is that people were intimidated, but but because there was so much stuff in your lectures, that uh, that some of them felt that they that's wouldn't. A complimentary way of <laughs> putting it. That's uh, uh, I heard. Uh, is, uh, I, what I've heard is uh, somebody called me Killer Kalabi. <laughs> But you didn't just work in Kähler geometry. You had other areas of differential geometry. Well, the, yeah, well, the uh, affine geometry is one, but uh, most of it is, uh, is again, again inspired by uh, Bochner's work. So the ideas of uh, elliptic differential equations. But uh, then, of course, my colleague at uh, Shushong Chen at Stony Brook is... is uh, Perhaps your, your yeah, most celebrated student. Well, yes, he's uh, my best known. Uh, and I, should, I should explain to yes. the, the, our listeners that the, that the proximate cause for holding this uh, interview is to celebrate the fact that Xu Shang uh, recently shared the Veblen Prize with Simon Donaldson and with Xu Shang's student, your grand student, oh, yes. uh, Song Sun. Oh, yes. But who the, was at Stony Brook also, well, but another, is now another, at another student I had, but. Only formally, the uh, uh, was not in my field at all. Uh, um, Mil uh, Milgram. The, oh, really? Uh, the younger Milgram. He he had uh, when his father died, when Arthur Milgram died. Uh, he he moved from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. He had already essentially written his thesis. I, I'm I'm just thinking, you know, back. Uh, you you really made uh, great strides in Kähler geometry as a branch of Riemannian geometry yes. in the in the fifties and sixties and seventies and eighties. Uh, but back in the nineteen fifties, how well did people really even understand what a Kähler metric was? Well, I understood it from uh, from the Bochner lectures. He, we asked him to give a course in differential geometry for the first time in my second year, graduate 48, 49, I guess. And uh, he defined it there, but uh, I understood it probably only uh, uh, about a year, a year after. In, in particular, I mean, it, 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 uh, it, it turns out that Kähler geometry is an example of uh, Riemannian geometry of special holonomy. Oh, yeah. and, and that fact seems to have just been ignored by uh, mm. many people on, on the kind of algebraic ge geometric end of things. Well, uh, yes, it was a it was, uh, it was really a remarkable discovery that uh, so it took years to focus from, uh, from his first announcement by Kera. <laughs> and my colleagues Xu Shang Chen and Simon Donaldson were kind enough to provide some questions uh, that I should ask in addition to the ones that pop in, popped into my own mind. Um, one interesting uh, question that, uh, that, that Simon raises is that um, in some of your early papers, you were interested in non kähler complex manifolds. In particular, with Ekman, oh. you found uh, a beautiful set of uh, examples oh, of uh, complex oh, structures on products of spheres, which uh, you know, are, are on manifolds that certainly can't admit Kähler oh, yeah. metrics because their second cohomology is trivial. That's right. Um, have you uh, followed the, the, these areas of non-Kähler complex geometry at all? Uh, no, just uh, the loose questions in my mind. Any, any more examples or uh, other than the usual? But uh, uh, 
I mean, after after Milner's discoveries, whether you can have also twisted spheres. Well, uh, questions about complex structures on the the, the sixth sphere are are. Uh, it's one of those annoying things that just won't go away. Um, oh, yes. It's unfortunately uh, one of those problems. Well, your father asked you about questions about prime numbers when you were small that yes. are basically are uh, still quite out of range of, of, of uh, uh, any technology yes. we, we have and m may always be. And so the, the, the complex structures on the sixth sphere is... Uh, yes, I've, the, I've been bothered by that one. <laughs> uh, the, the obstruction, the complex structures is, uh, is uh, basically unknown. Uh, once you have an almost complex structure, what's uh, obstruction to integrability? Another uh, uh, very interesting general question that Simon Donaldson uh, proposed was... Uh, when did you start really seeing uh, analysis starting to have a, a major impact in differential geometry? Um, from the correspondence I had uh, with, uh, with André May. <laughs> That's when you realized that it was, it was oh, an yes. essential thing, right? It was a, the, the pro it was a problem that was fundamentally analysis. But uh, I think the mathematician very often what to do even at a later age was originally in the mind much earlier. And Maybe uh, with 2020 hindsight though, sometimes you know, your ideas are so confused when you're young. <laughs> well, I don't know, uh, certainly confused when, you, when uh, learning things. Learning is a confusing process. And uh, uh, the, uh, the real learning takes place after you've uh, sort of Digested. <laughs> it's a digest learning is a digestive process, not a creative one. So, uh, in your own case, uh, we mentioned before this article on extremal Kähler metrics that uh, that came out in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, you're writing about things that you had started to think about oh, yes. years before, but actually being forced to sit down and write out the details, you've discovered new things. That's right. And uh, uh, that it's... Uh, well, that's the digestive aspect. <laughs> <laughs> I always think it's, a, it, it's very problematic when... Uh, this is no longer such a, a problem now with the... So many of our uh, publications are basically electronic. You know, you write a, a preprint, it goes on the archive. It, nobody's counting the pages. You're not, how much paper did you waste? Well, it doesn't matter because there's no paper involved. Yes. But there have been times I'm, I'm, not, I'm not used to that idea yet. <laughs> <laughs> that, must seem, that, must, that change must have seemed very strange to mathematicians oh, yes. of your generation. Oh. So someone always typed your papers for you, right? Well, I, I typed myself, actually, oh. slowly. And painfully with two fingers. How did you put in the mathematical symbols? Did you use typettes? Did you use a, an IBM ball? Or? No, in my right. hand. <laughs> put them in my hand. That's, that's actually a, a very tricky process, though, because you then have to remember. You, you, if you might type the page, you finally pull it out, and then you have to go back and remember all the oh, places yes. you... I guess it just becomes second nature, a habit. Yeah, well, you need the space. The only paper I ever produced that way was my thesis, and uh, really, it, I, someone else typed it, but I had to write in the symbols, and it, it was fairly unsuccessful because I mean, I, there were many places where oh, I well, forgot I to write in the symbols. I, rem I remember that well, <laughs> yeah, because uh, the process of my thesis, of doing my thesis, uh, and getting it ready for publication a year after uh, I delayed my wedding. <laughs> You had to leave your wedding for, for this? Dele no, it uh, delayed it. Oh, you delayed your wedding. I, so, I, I was not ready to get married until <laughs> it was finished with that. <laughs> <laughs> Writing has always been painful. <laughs> this is, uh, even composition writing in high school. The, uh, the, the, um, the, the math hour came to me with a sigh of relief. 
<laughs> <laughs> and yet you've, uh, uh, you know, of course you had to, to, to learn English as a foreign language. Did you arrive no, in? No, I don't remember learning English. <laughs> I had a, uh, uh, my parents started language training and I was the youngest. So the first uh, English, English nanny came when I was two years old. So I cannot remember. Oh, really? So you already knew English before you came to this country? And that's right. Ah, yeah. so that's... Uh, With an English accent, of course. <laughs> but that's a huge advantage. Uh, oh, yes. Not only in terms of uh, you know, having the good fortune to get out of Europe at a very, very bad time, it may have, uh, it may have helped the, the family get a visa because everyone already spoke English. Well, uh, we could also speak more or less. I mean, the, uh, uh, my parents spoke with a heavily accented English, but my father was well read in several languages. He used to read a lot. My mother, she, she was, uh, her education was sort of high school limited. But you also learned other foreign languages. I know that you oh, speak yes. German, for example. Uh, yes. Uh, French, perhaps? French, French I had in school. And then by living in France. German, uh, I had a, an English, still had an English nanny, and on a trip to, uh, uh, to Switzerland, I think. I heard her speaking German to the, she was fairly good in German. Uh, speaking to her in a shop or something. And I told her, well, why don't you start, start teaching me some German? I was just curious. But it's a, it's a, curi I mean, it's a common phenomenon in somebody who is, uh, I mean, uh, sort of intellectually active uh, to want to learn a language. It's, it's one, uh, a funny thing uh, in retrospect. Uh, the impression I must have made when I first came here, uh, speaking with the people I was just meeting for the first time, just for the first time speaking English uh, in conversation, casual conversation, rather than technical learning. Uh, meet somebody, uh, start asking, where, where, do you, where did you grow up? What languages do you speak? And people give me a strange look when, when I asked them that question. <laughs> <laughs> Why English, of course. English. In mathematics now, it's become less important to have a command of foreign languages. No, but when you, were, when you were growing up, uh, many of the papers were written in German or French. That's right. And I suppose that knowledge of these languages must have been very important for you. Yeah, but I mean, uh, that will occur later. Uh, my father was... Uh, an avid reader, uh, he had an extensive library of classical literature, both Italian, French, and some English. Uh, and he, he, uh, he, co he collected uh, sort of uh, uh, good editions, bound editions of uh, classical literature. And I started, after my first year of French in school, I, start, I had started reading, uh, let's say, the, um, the Count of Monte Cristo of <laughs> Dumas in Italian translation. And immediately after, I switched to French uh, after one year of French. So I just uh, learned the rules of pronunciation and grammar of French. And then reading it, I, I enriched my vocabulary. When I was in the army, serving in Europe, in the U.S. Army, and uh, I was on leave in Paris when they decided to look up my former class teacher from high school in France. Uh -huh. He was uh, living in Paris. Uh, I went to see him in his office and uh, spoke to him. He said, oh, yes, he, rem he remembered me. He was a good, fairly good student. And he had written, actually, in his report that I made b big progress in France. But then he, at the end of the visit, he said, it's strange. When I first knew you, you spoke French with, with an Italian accent. Now you speak it with, a, with an American accent. 
Well, you presumably had, uh, were there on a fairly brief visit, and if you'd been given a little bit of time, your, your French would have probably just come snapped back into focus. Oh, no, no it, it was fluid. I was, <laughs> working as, I was working as an interpreter anyway. <laughs> so you actually had to do military service at some point, you said, right? Uh, I, uh, two, year, two and a half years, uh, World War II, from 43 to f beginning of 46. D did they give you uh, a job that, in, that used your skills in any way? Translator, interpreter. Ah. Uh, I worked with, both with uh, Italian prisoners and French uh, civilian employees in various depots in France, and a, very, a few days in Germany only. So in the course of, of your career, you've seen you know, this, these enormous changes in the way that uh, mathematics is communicated. Oh, yes, I know that. Yeah, and I, I'm just... And I'm, I'm suffering from it. <laughs> I don't adapt easily. Well, so, it, you know, looking back, it, it, it seems like the number of mathematicians, uh, particularly mathematicians that did something that would be relevant to your own area, would have been relatively small, in fact, where you would yeah. have probably known almost everybody. Uh, I used to know. Uh, yeah. uh, so, I mean, um, it, mathematics was usually disseminated by, you know, they were male. Male. Male and telephone. And in particular, any, anything that was in the direction of a collaboration or dependent oh, upon... Yes. Uh, must, must had to be done in in, in those ways. Yeah. But also, you had to know. Uh, you already you could only exchange ideas with people if you already knew them, right? You, oh, sure. But you mean uh, you, that's why we went to meetings. Meetings are uh, useful. I think they still are. You have to go to shake hands and, and see what they look like. So, you know, your, some of your early work was uh, on complex manifolds and you were asking questions that were alien to, to uh, algebraic geometers because you were asking about, like... That's right. Uh, uh, were there ever any meetings where people, you, you would meet people that were interested in these topics? Or for, for what? Say, uh, let's say for uh, non-algebraic... Geometers. Complex, non -compl uh, complex uh, manifolds. Very that, few. The only one I knew was Bauchner and his... Uh, uh, his other students. How did so uh, when you collaborated with Ekman? How did you meet Ekman? Hopf was visiting Princeton, and uh, this is Heinz Hopf. Heinz Hopf uh, was visiting Princeton, and uh, I told him about the the, the construction, and uh, <laughs> Bochner bought me out for doing so, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, but Hoff told me that Ekman had done the same thing just <laughs> then. So we, uh, we decided, he put us in touch. I, ne I never met, I met him later or shortly later. Uh, we decided to write it jointly by correspondence. When you look back, at what point uh, did, did, was there a, a certain period of time when you really th thought, uh, uh, that what you were doing was uh, particularly fun and, and, and exciting, that you felt like this was the moment when, you, when what was... No. No, I was just uh, finding my way, essentially. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the first episode of, of uh, getting something into print, aside from the, the Putnam exams, <laughs> uh, the... the um, the, the paper that I wrote uh, uh, was from the problem posed by, by uh, Erdosh. Uh, so sums of... Yes, yes. Uh, sums of complex, of complex numbers or something. I'm just wondering, though, uh, you know, you've now, you, at, you're at a point in your career when your name... People probably don't realize Kalabi is a person. Kalabi Yao is... Uh, know, is, uh, is a phenomenon that you were telling me earlier that you there was a a, a dance performance called Kalabi Yao in New York and oh, yes. <laughs> so it's kind of entered in popular culture. Do you ever have the experience that uh, uh, 
people want to come up and ask you about physics or something like that? And no. Or string theory? No. Well, I heard, I heard about them, but... <laughs> no, my, uh, my favorite uh, sort of slogan to explain mathematics to the, lay, uh, to the layman is uh, uh, it's uh, quintessentially science fiction. Uh, I never quite understood the, uh, the implications. But it was a, a, it was a piece of luck. <laughs> uh, unexpected. Well, but on the other hand, sometimes when you just do what comes naturally in mathematics, it pays oh, off, right? It's yeah. a... that's, my, that's my luck. <laughs> Well, Jean, it's been wonderful interviewing you. I'm so glad that we could do this. Okay, well. And uh, I, I think that... Well, uh, as, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's an ego trip for me. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a well-deserved one. So, All right, thanks. Um, I think that uh, many people will find this interview interesting, and uh, I'm glad we were yeah. able to do it. All right. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks. Thanks.